Well, welcome, welcome everyone, and uh, good evening to you. I'm glad that, uh, that we're getting a really strong turnout. Uh, my name is Jim Williams. I am the Public Works Director for the City of Hamilton, and tonight um, you're going to hear the second of four public education seminars. The first one was held February 13th, uh, and that was on the right of ways. These um, seminars are being uh, taped by TV Hamilton, and they should be available on uh, YouTube uh, within the next month. And so, but tonight, um, for those of you who got here early, I'm sorry we ran out of um, handouts, but we passed out 15 handouts, and if there's additional, if you'd like us to email you the actual presentation, uh, we can do that. So just let us know, and we'll make sure we get you a copy of the uh, presentation tonight for those who don't have a hard copy. Um, now, so tonight, we're leading into um, our discussion on utility easements. Um, and so, um, that's going to be three speakers tonight. It's going to be Alan Messer, uh, Joy Rodenberg, and then we're going to finish up with Dave Bieneman. Um, then on March 13th, uh, we're going to come back uh, and have another seminar on stormwater, which is a huge topic here at the City of Hamilton. We dodged a bullet this past weekend. Um, and I think it's due to all the work that we did last year with our I&I &I, uh, corrections. And so um, the last one, as far as this public <coughs> seminar, is March 27th, and that'll be on water services. And that'll be with D D Dwight Col Colbertson, Nathan Perry, and Darla Bacchino. With that, uh, I would like to hand the mic over to Alan, and we'll begin our presentations. There you go. Thanks, Jim. I'm Alan Messer, I'm one of the engineers here at the city, um, if, if you'd like uh, water, feel free to help yourself there at the door. And um, some of my business cards are there at the door if you had any follow-up questions afterwards. But I'm going to go through the ease, utility easements here tonight. Going to go into a little more detail on stormwater and drainage rate related easements as we go through it. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about is the definition, what is an easement. Um, how do property owner know if they have easements on their property? Different types of easements, typical restrictions that those easements apply to the property. Um, I'm gonna go into kind of the basics of stormwater management so you can explain a little bit um, stormwater related easements. Some of the common stormwater concerns that we hear about here in the engineering department. Um, Drainage on private property, what to look for if you're purchasing a property. And um, then I'm gonna turn it over to Joy for the second part of this session to discuss upcoming capital improvement projects. And then we'll take a brief break um, before or going into the discussion on the trees. Um, what is an easement? Basically an easement is the right to use property for a specific purpose without owning that property. And that might involve the entire property, which is what's called a blanket easement, or it might be a very defined area on that property. For example, a certain distance off of the property line or a certain distance from the center line of a utility or some defined area. Um, it could benefit an organization, uh, could benefit a neighboring property owner, it could benefit the public as a whole in kind of what's called a right-of-way easement. Those are typically um, access, pass-through easements. The easements are established by agreement, um, or often they're shown in the subdivision plat, so it's subdivisions. When they're established, a number of easements will be um, put into place, and we'll look at some of those here in a moment. And I do want to make clear that easements differ from zoning. Zoning is a whole separate issue that could be a separate discussion in and of itself. So you may have additional restrictions that apply to a property in addition to any easements that are on that. And there could also be what's called covenant restrictions. Different places you could find an easement. Um, most of you, if you look at your deed, a lot of times they'll give references to deed book and page, which are other um, recorded documents that perhaps have an easement. Um, 
you could look up your subdivision plat. And if you have a question as far as a subdivision plat, we'd be happy to help you in engineering because we've got all those on file. We could do that for you. If you needed to go into any sort of in-depth research, you might need to contact a title agency and get a title search done. Um, if you're going to buy a new property, your realtor can help you with that kind of thing with um, what easements apply to the property. Some of the different types of easements I have listed here. Um, I'm going to discuss just those that deal with the municipality tonight, and that's um, typically utility, and I say specific or general. It could be a utility easement that any utility can use, or it might be a very specific utility easement where it says water line easement or sanitary easement or electrical easement. I'll uh, leave the electrical easement kind of aerial discussion to Dave for later in the program. So right now what I'm talking about is primarily pipes below ground or things that flow across the surface in this case of stormwater. The um, image that we have up here is a, what I'll say is a typical lot and some of the easements that affect it. And this is from their subdivision plat. Um, the green image on the left is a drainage easement. The orange easement to the front of the lot is a utility easement. And it's common for there to be a utility easement on the newer subdivisions along the frontage of the lot. There may or may not be additional ones in the rear. The um, large blue area there in the rear of the lot is what's a stormwater detention or a retention easement, and I'll go into what that means here in a moment. Some of the typical restrictions that apply to pipeline utility easements, um, drainage easements, you can't build any permanent structures on those within the easements. Um, and by permanent structures, it's not just a house, but it could be a pool, um, additions, garages, uh, et cetera, anything that really alters the uh, surface of that easement. Movable structures such as sheds, playground equipment might be permissible. That's one of those that you would want to check before you do it with the either the utility owner or the city. Um, pavement landscaping, again, is often permissible. Um, the easement that's shown up here is actually a gas pipeline easement. And you can s kind of see the clearing of the trees. Um, no houses that run from the upper left to the lower right. And you can see also that there's a parking lot that's built across that. That kind of thing often is permissible, but certainly something that you'd want to look into before you proceeded. Typically, um, here at the City of Hamilton, anyone else would not allow significant changes in the ground elevation. So that would be no cutting the grade down or placing a significant amount of fill um, makes it difficult to maintain the pipes or could make the pipes susceptible to damage if in, the, in either case. Um, access to those needs to be maintained. A lot of people build fences and that across, but the, the um, utility company maintains those pipes, still gotta be able to get in there in the case of a break or something and do maintenance on that pipe. And I say restoration is at the property owner's expense. That's typically how it is. Now, in the case of here at Hamilton, we're certainly gonna go in if we cut through someone's yard and restore that yard with grass. Um, a case would be if you had like something really elaborate, that may or may not be covered. So you have to use caution when you're doing anything within that easement. Now I'll talk just kind of some of the basics, um, give you the background of what stormwater management is so that we can have a better understanding of the drainage and stormwater easements. Um, stormwater is essentially precipitation of some type, it could be rain or snow melt. And what we're usually concerned with is the runoff. And the runoff is that stormwater that flows over land and does not soak into the ground. All of the stormwater here in Hamilton 
flows to the Great Miami River. A lot of people have the misconception that if something goes down a drain, a drain in the road or a drain in the yard, that that's headed towards the sewer treatment plant. That's not the case. Typically, it dumps directly into the river or into a, a creek or a ditch or something that leads to the river. As I mentioned, the, the runoff is what we're concerned with, and when you build on a piece of property, develop it, and, and particularly if you put down a hard surface such as pavement or a rooftop, that runoff occurs much more quickly than it does if it's grass or woods. And so what we're looking to do with a detention or retention basin, the stormwater basin, is to slow that flow down so that it leaves basically as close to the rate that it did prior to that development. Um, the difference between a detention and a retention is that a retention basin is basically a wet basin. It retains the water. So if you see a wet pond, a lot of the ponds that you see are probably retention basins. A detention basin is basically a big grassed area, a big bowl that um, slows the water down, it detains it, and in a very heavy rain, it should fill up and then drain out over 24 to 48 hours so that you don't get that flash flooding essentially downstream. We're also trying to slow it down to the point that the grit and mud and some of the pollutants will settle out before they leave the site and get into the streams. Um, and again, we're, we're all responsible for what happens there. As far as maintenance of stormwater, the city provides the, the items in the top there. Um, at the last session, Jim talked about the street sweeping, leaf and garbage collection, or certainly city um, services. Most of the facilities within the public right-of-way, typically the roadway, um, sidewalk to sidewalk, are maintained by the city, there are a few exceptions that we went over in the last session. Most of the facilities within a public easement, and those are, from what I've seen of subdivision plats within Hamilton are relatively rare. Most easements are private or perhaps designate an HOA as a responsible party. The city will do emergency abatement in those easements. Um, that's extreme situations if, as for example, a log jam is crossing a ditch and it's threatening to get into someone's house or over top of road, the city would get in there and remove that log jam. It's still ultimately the property owner's responsibility. Private maintenance responsibilities, and these could be the property owner or they could be an HOA in some of the newer subdivisions. HOA is a homeowner's association. Virtually any open ditch, open channels, ditch, creeks, et cetera, that's one that a lot of people are surprised by and they say, well, you know, this isn't my water that's flowing through here, but unfortunately the, the responsibility does lie with the property owner. Um, detention, retention basins, those are often the HOA's responsibility but could be the property owner's responsibility. What I'll call private lines, downspout lines, sump lines, those are the property owner's responsibility, and those are the property owner's responsibility until it gets into the public system. So even though that downspout line or sump line might extend out into the roadway, until it's part of that common system, it's the property owner's responsibility, including the connection into that pipe. Um, and then pretty much any other features located outside the public right-of-way. Some of the stormwater issues that um, we see most often here within Hamilton, um, we get reports of flooding. Um, we were lucky in this last rain. Um, we didn't have near the problems that some of the other communities had. Uh, surcharging structures, and that would be where a drain or a manhole is actually have water pushing up from underneath um, say a catch basin in the road that's supposed to bring water in is gushing water out those are the kind of things that we would appreciate if someone does see that you tell us about because it could be an indication of something that's um, blocked or 
some problem within the system that we need to investigate. Downspouts, sump lines, wall drains. This is what I hear probably half of the complaints related to. Um, so we'll talk in a little bit about what to do if you're improving your property, but as you're doing that, think about you know what the impact's gonna be on the neighbors. Uh, broken structures and sinkholes, erosion, there's a good picture up there in the upper left, standing water, sometimes aesthetics, and aesthetics is not necessarily a um, publicly maintained issue. Well, what residents can do to help is, like I said, if you notice one of these a significant issue, please let us know because we can't be everywhere, you know, when it when it's pouring down rain. And sometimes the only way we find out there's a problem is if somebody tells us. And you can report a problem using the city's 311 system, which is um, upper right hand corner of the city's website and the home page, or if it's an immediate need by calling the um, after hours number, which is 785-7550. If it's truly emergency, please call 911. You know, if there's some threat of harm to someone or to property, don't hesitate to call 911 in that instance. Um, proper disposals of pollutants, like we said earlier, everything ends up in the river ultimately, so the household cleaners in that dispose of properly. Um, Butler County Solid Waste Management um, has a website that kind of gives you some times during the year that they'll accept household chemicals and uh, they do some different things where they ex accept electronics and those kind of things but don't uh, certainly don't pour them down the drain and there's a lot of things that Rumpke would prefer not to see in the trash can as well. As far as your yard clippings, please don't blow them into the yard. The same with the leaves, except for the time when they're being rounded up for collection. You can compost those or um, dispose of them by some other means. We've seen some instances where there's quite a bit of, uh, say, grass crip clippings in the um, storm sewer where people, actually in one case, a landscape company, someone caught dumping all the grass clippings into the storm drain. And, it's, and I think it's, for the most part, just, you know, People don't realize what they're doing. They think, oh, it's an organic substance. It's going to be fine, but that's not really, it can clog the system, and then it's not good for the aquatics of the stream. Pick up your pet waste. Uh, too much of that, again, can cause contamination. And you can um, volunteer and spread the word. Um, one of the things we do do to spread the word, we've got these labels here that you may have seen on some of the catch basins in the road. Um, we actually use volunteer, volunteers to do that. One of the schools here recently had contacted me about getting a few hundred of these and going out, and they adhere to that, and that's to let people know, because a lot of people don't realize that what they put in that drain is going to end up in the river. Stormwater drainage issues on private property. The city does do some things, um, that would be maintenance of the public facilities that may be in a public easement on that property. If you have an issue that you would like us at, in engineering or public works to come take a look at, uh, feel free to call us and we'll come and assist with at least diagnosing what's going on there. A lot of times there's something that's relatively easy to fix by the, the homeowner that's causing them a significant nuisance. Um, we maintain and provide uh, stormwater and topographic mapping to people that ask. And then again, the emergency situations such as the log jams um, are something that city would do on private property. The city services do not include the settling of disputes between property owners. Um, we're happy to meet with two property owners. If they mutually agree to a solution that benefits them both, um, We'd be glad to offer assistance there as far as what could be done, but if there's a dispute between, between two property owners regarding drainage, only a court can decide that dispute. Maintenance of facilities outside of the public right-of-way or public easements 
are not maintained by the city. Um, a drive culvert, for example, or the ditches that I talked about earlier are the property owner's responsibility. If you're looking to purchase a property or make improvements on that property, some of the things to keep in mind, look for drainage channels, um, creeks and that, because there is a lot of responsibility associated with that. And what you see when you're looking out there on a dry day is probably not gonna be the high water mark. It's amazing really how much some of these channels will rise when it's really raining. Um, if there's wet areas in the yard, there may be something going on or it may be a, a nuisance that you'll have to deal with if you purchase the property. Look that the ground slopes away from the house. That's something that perhaps you can remedy if you buy it, but it's going to put water up against your foundation, maybe cause some um, water to get in the basements that we'll talk more about in a couple weeks at the next session. If there's utility structures, um, pole, a pedestal, a drain, a manhole on the property that you can see, then there's most likely an easement on that property. And I'll actually go back to the um, first slide as an example. This particular property is difficult to see, but um, there's an electric box in the distance there, street light, um, telecommunication pedestals, so this property actually has an easement across the front of it there by the road. What you see on the left is a driveway. There's actually another utility easement that follows that driveway. The driveway itself is an access easement. And then off a little bit out of the view to the left, there's a creek running through there, I guess more a ditch. That's got a drainage easement associated with it. And then off to the right, you wouldn't know this was here, but um, there's a storm pipe that runs through there, so there's a, a storm easement. Um, so that's the kind of things that uh, definitely ask your realtor, do your research before you get it, um, because you will ultimately be responsible for it. Before making improvements, check on those easements. If you're making any of those improvements I mentioned earlier that are could be restricted, um, consider the impact that your improvements have on your neighbors. Generally water is allowed to flow downhill, but if you redirect it or concentrate in some way and cause a nuisance for your neighbor, you may be liable for what trouble that causes them. And also call what's uh, the Ohio Utilities Protection Service if you're doing any kind of digging. Either yourself, whoever's doing the digging needs to make this call. If you hire a contractor, they should be making the call. Only the person that's doing the work is covered by the call. And if you call OOPS, which is you just simply dial 811 and then give them various information um, that insulates you somewhat from any damage that you might do to a, a utility as you're working there. And that call has to be done at least 48 hours prior to starting the work and um, can't be more than 10 days ahead of when you're going to do it. Um, we were going to save questions till the end, but that was a lot of material. And if um, anybody has any questions for me at this time, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. The decals, we contact to get some of those. If you'd like the decals and to do the labeling, you can contact me. You can pick up one of my cards there and I can get you some. They've got like a, a tar adhesive that uh, you peel off both sides and it sticks to it. There are a lot of them out there. There are a lot of them that have been out there for so long now that some of them are needing refreshed, we'll say. So I'd really appreciate any assistance with that. Uh, there's no other questions then I'll turn it over to Joy to talk about some of our uh, large upcoming capital improvement projects. Good evening everyone. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Um, like Alan said, my name is Joy. I work in the engineering department uh, mainly with the gas, uh, sanitary, and water utilities. 
And this evening we're going to go over um, our capital improvement projects that we have either under design or under construction this coming year. Um, we have a few major project areas um, that we're going to be working with. Main Street, River Road, um, South Hamilton Crossing, which that's been under construction, and then um, Corwin Avenue. This right here is a representation of the main Millville-Eaton intersection that is going to be uh, realigned. If you can kind of see it a little bit, the uh, Millville and Eaton roadways are now lined up. They are not going to be offset like they are right now. Is everybody good with that? I'll move on. Or? Do that. I'm sorry? When will they start that? Right here. Um, they're going to be starting that this summer. Probably, um, probably June. Is that, <clears throat> is that what it's shown in green space? Is that actually going to be green space like grass, park bench, walk path? I, be like I believe so. That's correct. Isn't it? For the short term, there's no immediate plans to pave it or anything. That's what I'd like to have out there for Main Street going to stay open on that? Main Street will stay open. Millville will have a closure, and so will Eaton. Main Street will probably have a two-week closure in the midst of the construction period at some point. You may want to repeat that so you can capture the mic. <laughs> okay. Main Street is going to um, stay open. Uh, Millville and Eaton will have periodic closures. Is that correct? Yeah, there'll be phases where they'll be closed completely. Okay. Phases where they'll be, con co excuse me, closed completely. Um, estimated construction cost for this is $2.3 million. Um, it will be starting this summer, and estimated completion is winter of 2019. It's a big project. Um, this is representation of the South Hamilton Crossing project, which I imagine most of you are already aware of. The estimated construction cost of that is $31 million. Um, it began construction in June of 2016 and should be completed by this fall. Our annual concrete and resurfacing program is going to be hitting various areas throughout the city. Um, Ohio Avenue, Susan, we've got Buckeye, Conn, um, South 2nd Street, Gulfview, Southern Hills Boulevard, Clovernook, uh, River Road, Hayes. Dixie Highway and Arlington. They're all going to have uh, concrete repairs and then resurfacing. The uh, estimated construction cost for this is a million dollars and we have a grant through Ohio Public Works Commission for that. Um, this project will begin in the spring and will be um, completed by the fall. Our water main projects, um, some of these are already under construction. The South, Han or the, I'm sorry, the Southern Hills Boulevard um, that whole Southern Hills um, subdivision is um, under construction right now. They're approximately halfway through it. Um, so they'll be finishing, finishing that here um, in the next few months. Um, main Street, we're going to be replacing a water main um, from the main Millville Eaton intersection down to B Street. Um, and that's going to be in conjunction with a streetscape project. Is that going to include storm sewage? The storm water pipes? No. Well, the intersection will have some storm work. Right. Everything else from there down only the it's water. It's just the water. water. Mm -hmm. um, North 3rd Street, um, it's going to be under design here uh, shortly, um, replacing a water main that's close to the um, power plant and then headed north towards uh, the water plant. Theodore Avenue, they're going to be starting construction here pretty soon. That's going to be uh, replacing the water main the whole distance of Theodore Avenue. Lincoln Avenue is um, water main replacement from Schuler um, to the um, dead end, I guess, there where the school used to be. And Heathwood, we're going to be um, replacing a portion of Heathwood water main. And like I said, Southern Hills um, is under construction. Bilstein Boulevard, um, that design is about complete, so it'll be under construction later this year. So the estimated cost of all those projects is $7.1 million. Um, some of the construction did begin last, last month, this month, um, and it'll be completed in the spring of 2019. Our natural gas projects that we're going to be having this year, 
Um, we had an extension on Gilmore Road. Um, that project was a short project and it is actually already done this year. And then um, down in the Lindenwald area on Van Hook, Hooven, Clinton, Tiffin, Chase, and Corwin, we'll be replacing the um, gas main on those streets. And those, those streets have got um, their uh, gas main is in an easement and we're bringing the gas main out to the street and changing the services um, of those homes. The estimated cost for those projects is a million dollars. Um, construction will begin in the spring and will be completed by the fall. And again, like I said, the um, Gilmore Road had a gas main extension that was completed at the end of January. Uh, our sanitary sewer projects this year, we have um, some of the projects, the ones that have the blue dot, those involve um, replacement of a portion of the sanitary main. And then we, the ones with the pink dot are um, lining the sanitary main. The main isn't um, in such a condition that it needs to be replaced. And so therefore, if we line it, we extend the life of it and get a longer um, use out of the pipe. So that's kind of in various, various places all over, over the city there. Um, Eden Park Drive is gonna be under design for that project, as well as Corwin Avenue. We're in the process of hiring um, consultants for those, and the rest of the projects um, we do in-house. The estimated construction for these projects is two million. Um, it'll begin in this, this spring, and then um, some of the larger projects will finish up probably fall of 2019. Are there any questions on our capital projects for this year? All righty. Well, thank you. I do have a question. Yes. <clears throat> We're at the main in Millville. Okay. All right. And the alleyway that runs from B to Millville on the south side okay. of the main. There were surveyors coming through there talking about putting in a new storm pipe down through that alleyway. That, that is a different project. We've got a consultant working on that um, to help with some of our stormwater issues. That's your project. That um, project is under design. There's no budget right now for the construction of it, but it would go through that alley and all the way up to Alton. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's important. A river runs through my basement. <laughs> <laughs> you should help a lot of people. All right, thank you. And we pay that alley. Yeah, good. Yes. Uh, also, regarding the Millville Avenue project, uh, I will. Uh, where the, uh, the green for the green spaces, uh, I think there are structures on those spaces. Will they be demolished? Or what's what's going on? And how many, what structures will be uh, demolished in the process of this? Project. Rich, Rich will answer that for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Joy is our utility engineer. And I'm the uh, director of engineering for the city, so I can answer that question. Uh, my name is Rich Engel. Uh, the city purchased 604 Main Street, which is the greenhouse on the north side, northerly side of Main Street. We also, through the project, purchased the um, auto sales place so that has already been purchased and then we also purchased the uh, insurance building which is at the corner of millville and main street and one other item i'd like to add about that project is really important for the residents to know is the fact that the, we uh, were able to obtain a safety grant from odot for 90 percent of the project cost not just the construction but 90 percent of the project cost so not, they have assisted us with payment to the consultants and the property purchase and all of the uh, environmental uh, research that had to be done for that project and then also as we move into construction they're paying 90 percent of that too so the city's investment in the project total is probably around five hundred thousand dollars and the ODOT's portion is probably close to three million dollars any other questions about that project uh, well, what, was acquiring this property is really necessary for safety? Or, it was, a, or like, was, what it was it? necessary to align the two streets across from each other, Millville and Eaton. Can I intercede here? Mm -hmm. 
I see about two wrecks a month and more in the winter at that intersection. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen cars parked up in the fence at Walgreens. So, that's so again, main, that's the main thing through the grant funding, it was a safety grant. So ODOT recognized that that is a safety uh, issue there. And we also received safety funding for the improvements out here at the high MLK intersection. Again, a 90% funding from ODOT for that project. And we're also starting the main serial McKinley Haldeman Western. I think I got them all. <laughs> we're starting that intersection. Again, we're getting uh, two and a half million dollars from ODOT for that intersection improvement. And that's under starting design right now. So that'll probably be in 2020, I believe, when that project will be under construction. So as we find these opportunities, we're really trying to get additional grant funding, uh, especially through the safety program that helps us with these improvements. There's another question back in the back. No. The, the, Go ahead. The, the, the high, high accident um, intersections in the city, are you doing any of the roundabout construction? Mm -hmm. The county's doing quite a bit of that. But we will be having a roundabout and that depends on if the uh, champion sports complex proceeds we would put because we're relocating B Street to the west side of the champion site we would have a roundabout at Ray Avenue and B Street the relocated B Street but that's only if the project proceeds and it appears likely that it's going to proceed but it's still not definite yet that's on the hill Yes, it is. <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what, are the, what are the plans for the Pendle Flats? It's 100 North B Street. I believe the city acquired it, but uh, uh, I believe that uh, could possibly be, be in the, the uh, historic district. Or, I don't know if it's in the Rossville historic district, but I, I think that building uh, has historical significance that uh, actually escaped the collision with uh, the uh, is that at the corner of the Park Avenue ramps and B Street? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's uh, 100 North B Street. It's at B Street and Park Avenue. Again, if the Champion project proceeds, that project, that uh, building will be demolished and we'll have an additional right turn lane installed at that intersection. That's right, it's probably full of asbestos and lead paint anyway. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The, the project that the the high uh, or the main Eaton Millville would that have been a candidate for a roundabout because you've got, you've got the room to top eight? Probably not. It, we, we would have had to purchase a lot more um, property, real estate to make that happen because it is a truck route. That is a state route going through there, and Millville is also a state route. We would have to purchase a lot more right of way and make it. Um, a lar much larger roundabout. So it was considered initially, but um, we're not going to proceed with that. It's We're, we're putting in a regular uh, intersection. Now, I do have some other ideas for roundabouts in the city. How about Northwest Washington and Cleveland? How about that for a roundabout? There's a lot of traffic that comes there, and that's a four-way stop. And then also Laurel and Pleasant is another idea. That would take some intersection or some property acquisition, but Again, these are future thoughts and ideas that we're thinking about and seeing what might work. Yes, sir. Uh, through the presentation, there were uh, I think two projects on Corwin Avenue uh, to be digging up the street. Is that going to happen at the same time? Or is that going to be one was sanitary and the other one was gas line re uh, replacement? No, they will not happen at the same time. We're still studying the Corwin Avenue sanitary piece. We're hiring a consultant to evaluate that. There's some capacity issues on the sanitary there. And uh, we'll be um, doing some more uh, studies on that first, but the gas will proceed this year. Okay. Anyone else? Hold them in, uh Main Street, or you're looking for a roundabout possibly there? Uh, possibly, but I doubt it. I think a realignment like we're doing at Maine, Millville, and Eaton will be most more likely than a roundabout. It's in the consultant's um, report to consider a roundabout, 
but um, I don't I don't think it's going to work there quite frankly anything else anybody else well, thanks everyone for your time Mr. Engel, as you can see, has a lot of experience here with the city and a lot of uh, knowledge about, historical knowledge about the various road prop improvement projects that are going on. Um, I'm going to ask your patience as we do all this new development um, and improvements because it's going to take some time and it's going to be a little bit of a traffic inconvenience. So um, it's just part of moving Hamilton forward. So with that, uh, wanting to move forward with our, our presentations. Would, would anyone like to take a short break? If so, we can. If not, we can still we can continue. Is it the vote to continue? Okay, super. Well then with that, Mr. Beeneman would like to come up and uh, provide his presentation on, I believe, street trees. Yeah. You need this. Oh, I need that? Yes. Go time. I thought I talked. <laughs> Can you hear me? Wow. Boom. Boom. Ready? Are we fired up tonight? Wasn't the engineering great? Let's give a round of applause for engineers, Mr. Engel. That, the fact that you understood all that was outstanding because they do great work. They put up with me. I'm kind of like the, in the city, the tree guy is what the mayor calls me. And that's absolutely fine because my background is a degree in forestry and fish and wildlife biology, captain of the United States Army, jumped out of helicopters, fought fires out in western states and crazy stuff like that. So we're going to have fun tonight, but they had the great talk and I really learned a lot from that because when you work with engineers, you know, you think they're, they're all, everything's got to be square, everything's got to be straight. And you know, when I plant trees up in Bowling Green where I came from, the wind would blow out of the southwest. That's why we're called blowing green with the wind turbines. So I would plant the trees five degrees to the southwest and then five years they'd be straight because if I planted them straight they would have a lean and people call me up and go my tree's crooked especially engineers no offense Alan Rich and everyone here they go my tree is not straight and I go they're not utility poles they're supposed to grow crooked in the wild right we've seen trees out there infrastructure so I'm going to talk about street trees this is going to be fun I'm the fun guy so we're going to have a good time are you ready this is going to be four years of college and I don't know I might have two hours here you ready Oh, you don't have that much time. All right, we'll go, we'll go forward. Now, I'm an impromptu speaker, won state championships, so the slides are for your benefit. If I don't go off the slide, that's okay. You just go with me and listen, but you can look up there and see what I'm going to talk about. Because a lot of people, what is the right-of-way? That was our first talk that we had two weeks ago. What is a right-of-way priority tree program? Probably don't even know we have that program. We're going to say, what is the priority tree program, and what are we doing today? And We'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about trees and utility easements. Believe me, I get all the calls. Matter of fact, I get calls. The, the tree on my neighbor fell on my garage, and I need you to tell the neighbor to take it off, right? That's what I'm here for. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Capital projects. Capital projects involve trees. Believe me, when we come out to do the gas, water, underground electric, overhead electric, put in new poles, well, guess what? Everybody plants the farm in the way. And I am the guy. I am the guy that comes out and knocks on your door and says, yes, you know that lilac tree you planted in honor of Jebediah Smith, who founded Hamilton, I have to cut it down. So I'm that guy. I'm also the guy that comes out and tells you the good news when you have a tree with problem. I remember one customer in town called me up and he was very upset. And I said, what's the matter? My lilac tree, it's dying, and I plant it for our anniversary for the wife. And I went out there, and you know what he did? He took a weed whacker and just tore it up, getting the weeds and the grass. But he actually took off the bark and the water-conducting cells of the lilac, and he killed it. But luckily for him, I said, look, I'll tell her it's this disease, and she'll never know, and we'll call it good. And he goes, thank you. I go, you just buy a new one. See, that's good stuff, right? We like that. We'll talk about underground facilities and landscape grass restoration. So we talked about a lot of projects. And here's what happens when we start a project. We say we're going to start in May and we're going to finish in September. Well, we all know it's going to rain, right? It's going to get cold. And our equipment's big and it's heavy, 26,000 pounds. We roll down your street and it looks like a bomb went off. And we have a lot of obstacles that you have to walk around and dodge. We worked in Highland Park. I'll talk a little bit about that and what we went through. But understand this, we plant grass from April 1st until October 31st. After that, 
It's a no-go Charlie. So when people call me up in January and they go, they wrecked my yard, Mr. Beeman. I want them out right now. It was 20 degrees and snowing. And I go, do you think we can plant that grass? No, I'm kidding. But anyhow. And we're going to talk about our tree planting program in a little summary. So let's start everything off. Now you know you have a quiz at the end of this, right? You got the handouts. Everybody's got the handouts. You're going to have a quiz. So let's start off with the quiz. Take a look at that up there. This was for our tree board, their first quiz you have to pass. And you look at that, and you ask them, is it a utility tree, dead tree, banded tree, or tag tree? Now, of course, I didn't use anything here in town. This picture's from somewhere else because didn't want any locals getting any idea. But of course, we all know it's a utility pole, right? That's not a tree. That's right. That's great. But up north, the mayor's wife in Bowling Green was on the tree board. She goes, is it a banded tree? And of course, I felt bad when I had to clunk the old utility pole, tore her up. It's all good. All right, here we go. What is the public right-of-way? Public right-of-ways are that area between the curb and the sidewalk. And we have all kinds of things in there. Now, this modern convenience, I can, like I can do a pointer on myself, right? You can see it. But I can't point at these screens because they're real fancy, high def, and they don't allow it. But really, what we have in those little right-of-ways out there are underground sewer, underground electric, gas. There's all kinds of bonuses in there. The sanitary sewer connection, storm water. And then, of course, overhead, we'll have utility poles. Now, what's on a utility pole? Well, you know how we all are. We don't play nice. So Hamilton Utilities is on the right side of the road with the electric. Cincinnati Bell is on the other side of the road with the shorter poles. Because if we're both on the same pole, someone has to pay the man. Either we're paying Cincinnati Bell because our facilities are on theirs, or they're paying us because they're on ours. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, when I, and same with Duke. You know, Duke Energy rolls through town. I get calls down in, uh, let's see, I got to think of the country. I don't know the subdivision, but down off of New London Road, Columbia Road. Duke runs rear lot. Hamilton Utilities runs front. And I'll get a call and say the trees are in the wires, and I roll out. But here's the good news. I work for First Energy up in Akron, so I know all the utility people and all the big investor-owned companies. So I make two phone calls, and they come out and take care of them. So that's a little bonus of, of being around the block. By the way, I've moved from Iowa, Arkansas, let's see, Georgia. I was a captain of the United States Army, Fort Lewis and Seattle, and then here in Ohio. So I've moved about 15 times in 30 years. Now for my wife, this last move, I told her three moves ago would be the last one. So I'm hoping I don't have to tell her again, unless the daughters move somewhere. All right. You thought this was about trees. You're getting the whole banana tonight. Okay, good stuff. Street trees, there they are. That's, that, that's out there in Hamilton Enterprise Parkway. We put 30 brand new trees. Part of our goal is to work with our economic development group. We're trying to bring in new businesses. That's out there where Bethesda's the hospital is. And uh, let's see, BART is out there. And we've got a couple of more companies coming in, I think, new. This is good stuff. But the big thing is, did you see the new trees on High Street when you roll in town? We just put out 30 new trees. We try and plant them properly spaced. And you say, what's out there? Well, we're planting Kentucky coffee trees, shingle oaks, hackberry, bald cypress. We're trying to put the natives back because right now, what don't we not want to do? Plant all chestnut trees, right? Remember back in the day? And then we ordered some pallets from Asia. We got the blight. And we took out it. Now, remember this number. Four billion chestnuts died. Then... We went nuts and planted American elms. And guess what? Brought in another crate in 1929 from Asia, right here in Ohio. And four billion elms died. So we said, we can fix it. We're going to plant ash in place of the elms. And we did. We planted them everywhere. Matter of fact, uh, I know uh, State Urban Forest grew up in Northeast Ohio. Cleveland said, plant ash. It's the greatest thing. And now, He's the hangman because they go, remember, Mr. Seward, you said to plant those trees. So what we learned is you just can't plant all subdivisions to one species because of the bugs and the diseases and all this. Now think of this. Anybody been out to Colorado, flown over it, the Rockies? Okay. When you look on the east side of the Rocky Mountains, there's pine. Well, the pine bark beetles are moving north and moving up because it's warming up. I, I don't know about climate change and all this, but here's what I'll observe. Beetles are moving up into trees that have never been geographically or ecologically fought each other, like battles, right? So these beetles are going north and just wiping out pines. Now, when you go on the west side of the mountain, where it's a little bit drier, 
there's a great diversity of pine, so it's only taken out maybe 10 or 15 percent. So when you fly over, you see these big red areas on the east side, and you go, it's a fire. Well, no, that's the dead pines. And when you roll over the other side, it's still green because of variety. So that's things we're looking at doing when we're doing our street trees. This is good stuff, right? Four years of college, two hours. Okay, street trees. Here's the thing in this city. In the great state of Ohio, about 15% of cities require property owners to maintain the trees in the right of way. We happen to be one of them, okay? Here in Hamilton, there's an ordinance, and I'm not going to read you to the number. It's like BR549, rid of habeas corpus. There's all kinds of language. If you want a copy, I'll give you my information. You can get me, and I'll gladly send you a link. You can go on the city of Hamilton, codified ordinances, pound in trees, and boom, and there's about 30 pages of bonus. Bless you. And in this case, if you take a look at that tree, what we require is to have nine feet of clearance over the sidewalks and 14 feet over the street. Remember, snow plows, buses, 14 feet tall, right? You've seen the trees where they get trimmed now on the tree and you go, get trimmed like a square because that's where they go through and run. So those are things that uh, I go out and inspect and take a look at. Now we have a 311 system. You call me up and say, hey, there's a tree out here and it is tore up. It's grown over the curb. It's got a hole in it. It's got a cavity. Well, that's something I'll come out and we'll take a look and see what we can do or address. Now again, remember by ordinance, it's a property owner responsibility. And so we try and work with the people if there's some utilities, I'll get into that. But uh, typically I have to send a letter and say, hey, we need to get the tree down a reasonable amount of time. Priority removal program, now here you go. What was that and what's going on? So when I hired in as the first municipal arborist utility forester, we hired Davy Tree Resource Group who had degreed foresters and certified arborists like myself. They went out and inspected every single tree in the right of way, every single tree in all 36 parks, every single tree in the two city owned golf courses. There are, <clears throat> right now, we had about 15,000 trees. Now here's a good thing. When you go to council in January and you've only been on the job three weeks, three days, and they go, how many trees do you think we have, David? I go, 15,000? Well, it was 15,122, and that's pretty good for not living here or being from this country. So I remember seeing the mayor and council's eyes go, he's in, and I went, great. Anyhow, all right, so let's take a look at it. So we looked at those trees and we found out we had 2,000 trees out of the 15,000 out there recommended for removal. So of course our Hamilton Parks Conservancy they are a separate entity, so they'll take care of those trees. The two golf courses are enterprise zones, so they take care of those. Now the street trees. What I did is I went to the city administration and I said, boy, it'd be great if the general fund could give me money so I can help out our citizens and businesses. Well, graciously, the city manager and council gave me $100,000 last year in the budget, and we were able to address 144 street trees. And these were big, these were dead, and very costly. And we were able to go out and cut those trees down and remove them and haul them away at no charge. You wouldn't believe how happy people were, the blessings that I got. So there's the tree, you see what it looks like. Now in this case, the storm came through, ripped off half the tree. So when I go out and mark them prior to the priority program, we send out letters to everybody saying, hey, you're." You, if you'd like to participate, you're on the Priority Tree Program and the city will do it at no cost. And it's hallelujah when they get that letter. Now what happens is, is Alan gets the letter, James has got a tree that's tore up, but Alan gets the letter and James says, well, Mr. Beaneman, mine's right here. I look on my priority list. Well, James is down at number 1201 and we just did 144 trees and his happens to be number 89. So I did get a lot of calls from people going, what about my tree? And because you're doing my neighbors and that's what happened. And so Wilson went out. They, you've probably seen Wilson working out today. They were over by Fort Hamilton, over there by Ray, and they were gr they're grinding the stumps because I required them to grind stumps and reseed the grass. And they're going to be done with everything because remember, when do we seed grass? April 1st we start. So you can see they'll be done in April. And we notified everybody and kept them in the loop. Now where we can, we're going to go back and put some trees back at no charge as well. Holy cow, trees and utility easements. You know when we trim the trees what they look like, right? Do you remember that old song? Well, everybody in here is old enough. Y M C A Pac-Man, right? When we trim the trees, some of the trees look like that. When we get done, they look all whopper jawed. Well, understand this. I work for a big utility, and 
Trees and vegetation are the number one cause of outage for us, whether it be storm growing up into it, it causes a lot of problems. When I got here, we had lots of tree outages beyond your wildest dreams. Matter of fact, while I was here last year, in a meeting with the mayor, city manager, PUC, two in the afternoon, a beaver chewed down an ash tree over on Gilmore Road and knocked out the transmission. And it sent a message to Duke to turn off the power. So guess what? On January 8, 2017, at 2 p.m., the power went out to the entire city of Hamilton. The entire city of Hamilton. It took us two hours to get it back up. And then we, we, I knew where it was because everybody looked at me in the room and I said, those damn beavers got me. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Tore me up. But uh, anyhow, then we went out there. We knocked out all the trees. We had to go through the bird sanctuary, but unfortunately, we had to get those trees out. And we've cleared it. It's done, so we shouldn't have a problem. But then the beavers in September got me again. The last spot in the swamp, I couldn't get to it because we couldn't drive our trucks in the swamp, and that beaver got me again. So, me and Mr. Beaver got a thing. It's like that gopher on Caddyshack Well, me and that beaver got a thing going on. Right and I'm after him. <laughs> Bill Murray, that's it. So we do come through. We're on a five-year plan. The city has about 250 miles of electrical lines that run. And in this city, like most, 75% are lines in the rear lot. We've hired Asplen Tree Expert Company. They're the firm working for us. We're working, when I say substations, I'll just say we started at the sub on Eaton Road across from Hamilton High School, and then we moved over to the sub on Stahlheber off of Maine. That's sub 12. And when we're almost done, we'll be finish up in April, then we're going to the sub eight, which is on Wasserman. So we'll be working on the west side. And as soon as that's done, we'll be, excuse me, right here downtown. And we notify everybody six months in advance. You get a letter, it's from me saying, hey, we're coming. And uh, it's just like a hurricane. You think of the Tasmanian devil when I'm down there. It's just a big hurricane and there's stuff blowing. You don't know what happened. But we go through and clear. And a lot of times we have trees break off. They fall into the line. So what do we need to do? When we clear, we go 10 feet minimum around those wires. So if you think of the wires, a lot of times, now the wire from the pole to the house, pole into your house, if you will, that's called the service or secondary connect. We just trim about a foot of clearance, as long as it can swing and there's nothing on it, so we don't cut down trees for that. If you need a tree cut down for that particular line, you call our line department, we'll disconnect the line for a service you hire and that. And then, but the high voltage lines, the one that are up on a big cross arm, there's three wires up there, or maybe a single, you'll see an insulator up there. That's where we're going up and getting that 10 foot area. Now you say, well, Dave, I know you need 10 foot, but on my tree, you actually took it 20 feet back. You have lost your mind. Well, we're coming in on a five-year cycle. So when a tree grows, and I'll pick silver maple, they grow three to four feet a year. So if we're taking out 12 to 15 feet to get our clearance for every five years, what happens is when you trim a tree, and this is great, right? I like anatomy, so I'm gonna be the tree. My fingers are out there with the leaves and branches. My wrist is a joint, elbow's a joint, and then the trunk is me. When you trim trees, you don't wanna make internodal cuts. Do you ever see trees in town cut like this? Those are those internodal cuts where you're cutting. A joint would be called a lateral or your elbow or to here. So if I have to make a clearance cut that's right here, the natural says I have to come back to the elbow. Now to get my clearance, if I'm between here and the trunk, you can't leave a dead stub right there. If that's just not from a horticultural standpoint in the tree, it will die back to stem so the proper cut is back here. So if that's 20 feet back from the line, it's 20 feet whether it be a tree in the road or a tree in the back lot. So it all depends on the trees. Big older trees that grow slow, you don't need as much clearance. Big old 200 year old oaks don't grow just like a, so think of willows, cottonwoods, poplars, the sycamores, maples, fast growing trees, you need more clearance, slow growing trees, not so much. So we, uh, we're doing it, we've cleared, and I can tell you the outages have gone down to almost nothing from trees. Matter of fact, in 2017, we set a record for the city, and I know that they won some national award in D.C., but that's good when the bosses and council get that stuff. That's good for all of us in this town, especially, you notice all the storms lately? 30,000 out at Duke, 30,000 out at Dayton, Butler Rural, City of Hamilton, zero, and that's the way we like it, right? That's good stuff. You getting your money's worth tonight? Yay? Yeah? I see smiles. 
Now I do get calls. People say, hey, there's a wire going through my tree. Will you get it? I went out to this property and sure, there's a telephone wire, there's cable TV, there's all kinds of wires. So one of the things we're doing is revamping our website. So in the near future, you're gonna see a pole with a picture of a cross arm and wires. It'll label them so it's a little bit easier to understand what wires are. Now obviously we don't expect everybody in here to know what the wires are. So you can call me, go in on the 311 system, or our electrical department will come out and take a look at it. But one thing we don't do, we don't prune for Cincinnati Bell, Duke, or Time Warner Spectrum, I gotta remember all the names. Because uh, I'll tell you this much, in the old days when I lived in Akron, my bank was First National Bank of Akron. Then it bought this bank, that bank, now it's called First Merit. And then they got bought out, and now I think they're PNC or something like that. But anyhow, that's good stuff, right? I like it. Okay, now take a look at that. Boom, storm comes, boom. The private tree falls on the shed, falls on the car that's just to the left of the garage, smashes the roof, busts out the windshield but it's on our power lines. So here's a case where the property owner, before anything can be done, all we're gonna do is cut our lines in the clear, pull them out. They're gonna have to call their insurance agent to come out and get estimates for repairs. They're gonna have to get someone out there to get that tree off their garage and car. Anytime a tree falls on the house, falls on somebody's private property, we're just gonna disconnect facilities and pull them back until they get it taken care of because we can't assume any liability. Because you know, trees, believe it or not, that particular tree probably weighed 20,000 pounds. So if we go out there and start cutting on it, it takes the tree to the ground, takes the car to the ground. Uh, our contractor, the city's now bought a car and a garage. So these are things I make people aware of when we get bad storms, I go out and we talk. and it. I feel bad. I want you to know that particular couple had just bought that house. It was beautiful property, tons of trees. Storm came through and knocked down every tree. So they probably had $10,000 just to tree work, let alone their garage and car and a few other things. So the, these are things that happen in storms. That's why we're out there pruning and going through. Now I will tell you this, an ideal tree under the wires you see us planting would be a dogwood, a red bud, or a lilac tree. So if you see these big maples under the wires, and that's why they look, you know, like the devil, I had moments say it looked like the devil when I looked down at my tree. Well, we're, we're trying to get the large trees out and make sure people plant the right tree in the right place. This is good stuff, I like it. Take a look at that, capital projects, what do we do? You heard uh, Joy and Alan talk about resurface projects and contracts. We do utility pole replacement. On big transmission poles, we're doing 600 poles a year in the city replacing. And we have over, gosh, 25,000 poles if you count all the line miles. And then we're doing gas and water lines and railroad crossings. Now I know it's hard to see, but that black dot up there was made by what they call a pileated woodpecker. It's the size of a crow, it's black, a little bit red in the cape, and that hole was about six inches around and about a foot in and about probably a foot down. Now we had to replace that pole. Now one of the good things is, is that the city was able to send myself and a couple of the engineers to pilot school. So now we're the flight team and we fly drones and so we can get a pretty good bird's eye view of these uh, deficits and issues. So that's a, that's a good thing that we're able to do. So let's take a look. Now this transmission line, we, just so you know, the city actually owns uh, eight different power plants or parts of across the country and this particular line is in Greenup, it's in Kentucky. And I don't know if you've ever been down in that country, but it goes up a mountain, down a mountain. And what's really nice about the drone is you can sit at the bottom out and fly that thing right on up. Now the line you're looking at right now, you couldn't even see the wires, the trees and some brush were burning in it. And we were getting momentaries on that line. Now that line goes up and interconnects with AAP. Then we have the Meldal line that connects with Duke. And these are critical lines. So one of the things that I am involved with is we went down, I, I walked that entire line all 20 miles up and down the mountain over a week. And uh, you know, you run into all kinds of stuff down there, critters and bugs and farmers and everybody's wanting to know what's going on. And you know, even though you have all your safety gear on and a ATV that says Hamilton Utilities, but it's a, it's a different country down there. But what we did is we went and assessed it. We were able to get money and allocate from AMP Ohio. We're part of that. And we, they were able to share 50% of the cost so the city didn't bear all the costs. So here's a line that was in danger of having outages. And now 
it's pretty much like a gas pipeline. You can drive from one end to the other. And we did take pictures of before and after, pretty dramatic and uh, it's interesting. But the main thing is so our crews can safely go up and down those lines, repair poles, repair wires, because every now and then we'll get an ash tree. Now, no beavers in that country, it's too tall for them, but I don't know, dead ash will fall out toward that line. And here's another thing we do with our capital projects. We have water lines that have issues. Now take a look, here's a giant maple. The roots had got into the basement basin and it had got into the customer's water line. That water was actually leaking. You know, they were gonna get a bill for $1,000 of water use, but it was the tree, so we had to go out and remove the tree, make repairs. So these are things that the city will do, these emergency repairs that Alan talked about that we do. Now on Highland Park, we had 190 trees involved in that water line replacement. So I went out with the engineers and we went out and looked at it and we were able to save 100 and I think 40 had to be removed because the water lines had to go from an engineering standpoint. I remember they like straight lines, no, no 90 degrees. Well, I got them to bend over a little bit like the tree and we bent them a little way and bent, put some elbows in, but uh, we were able to only take out 40. And now going back to replace, we only could do 20 because of the restrictions on one of my handouts I gave you, well, I won't go over it, but I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but where we can and cannot plant trees and we're too close to facilities. Ooh, there we go, Buckeye Street, South Second Walnut, we talked about capital projects. So here we go out and there's a tree in the right of way. Now think of this, I'm the tree. Well, we got a cut for the curb and I got a cut for the sidewalk and I got a cut for the driveway. Well, if I've just cut 75% of the root system, what's going to happen? I either got to fall on you, on your house, or I got to fall back on a car going by. So out there, there were about 20 trees. We took out nine because they were not going to be structurally safe. The root systems were going to be compromised. So what's good about having somebody that knows trees and trees biology as a forester, I can work with the engineers because, you know, they're, they're all about angles and that cosine. I didn't do very well in math, so I rely on Alan to help me out and James. But the bottom line is, I'm the biology guy and the science guy. So even though we can cut roots and do all these things, at the end of the day, I got to look at 20 years from now. Now, I won't be working here, I'll be long gone, but the point is, I want the trees to last as long as they can. So we want to make the right decisions on behalf of the public and the tree. Holy mackerel, what button did I push? Danger, look out. Stop that button. Okay, good deal. Take a look at here. I got a call from a resident. They said, something got tore up. What happened? Sidewalk's gone and there's dirt and gravel. What? There's flags in my yard. Well, I went out and took a look. Well, of course, they had a leak in the water line and the gas line. So they had our crews went out and made repairs. They got to go out with the backhoe. They go out there and dig it up. They have to shut everything off, cap it off. So sometimes they have to pull sidewalk. Then what happens is typically they do this Grass planting time is when? April 1st, October 31st. So we do it between November 1st and March 31st. And they go, I want grass now. And I go, it's 15 degrees. I can't do it. God bless. So we have to pack in gravel, pack in soil, and do all that. And it looks awful. I get it. And then magic. I come out with Mr. Wilson in the garden center. The wand goes and boom, you got grass in about 21 days. Remember when you put grass seed down, it takes 15 to 21 days to germinate when it's 55 degrees, 24 seven, growing degree grace. I've had people go, you put the grass in on Monday and it's still grass on Friday. And I go, yes ma'am. Give me 21, 15 days, I'll be out. I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> and so that's stuff that I get the calls. They have not repaired my lawn. It's March. Why haven't they come out? Well, when we come out, we take in backhoes and bobcats to grade it out. Well, I can't drive in your yard when the ground's moving and it's wet. So sometimes I tell people we start in April, but we may not actually get to them till Memorial Day. They get feisty, they get fired up. So I have to take them out, a few lifesavers. You know, like your mom gave you at Christmas time. I always got the same thing in a box and it was little. I'd look at it and go, oh, I got those lifesavers. They were the rainbow flavor and I liked them. Okay. Now, what else do we do? We go out to substations where we make repairs. There's a sub up there on Eaton Road across from Hamilton High. Take a look at that. That sub was the Amazon forest, trees all over, dead ash. So of course, you know what I do, boom. I went in there, Fox 1, two Sidewinder missiles, cleared it out, and all the neighbors went, good Lord, what just happened? All the calls to upstairs. 
and they go, it's got to be the tree guy. Who else is out there causing commotion? Well, then we went back, reseeded it. We put in what they call no mow grass. And the reason behind that is that's our substation. The grass grows about four to six inches tall. You mow it once a month. So we cut down on using mowers, cut down on all that carbon dioxide and gas use and crew time. We put in low trees. Now every tree, I stood in everybody's front yard across the street with the landscaper and said, put a flag where I think every tree should be. So when I'm looking at it from my house, which was the six houses, I made sure every one of those were strategically planted. So when they grow up and fill in 20 by 20, they'll not see the sub. And it was all six houses. Now they didn't know I was doing that. Was I in their front yard, you know, I'm standing on their front door looking over there and they go, there's that tree guy and what's he doing? What's he planning? All right, take a look at that beauty. We got a lot of beauties like that. Remember the 2,000 hazard trees in town? So there's a tree where it's planted in a two foot right away. Well, we no longer plant giant trees in two foot right of ways. Now, there are trees out there and there are some small trees. One of the things we're gonna be going to do with the small trees in these right of ways that are smaller than four feet, my interns are gonna go out and log them all in this summer. They're gonna come to me and I'm gonna come out knocking your door and go, God bless, but you got six months to get that little guy out of there and plant it in your yard, or I'm coming out and we're gonna dig it up and I'm gonna put it in one of our parks in your name. But I gotta get it out of there because when you have that small infrastructure, we jack up the curbs for Alan, I get in his water lines, gas lines, sewer lines, and it bucks up the sidewalk. And then we got ADA, people trying to get down the road with walkers, buggies, bikes, wheelchairs, and you've got this tree with it all jacked up. So that's why we're gonna have to address that. Now, I'm hoping in the 15 years I got left here, I can address all those. Get them all out of there. Look at that, there's my interns. Tree plant and benefits, uh-oh, you got that handout? Look at that, I even gave it to you. So I'm, I'm gonna blow through these sides. It tells you all the good stuff about trees, why we're here, why we're doing it. Air cleaning. One of the things that, there's a new thing out there. Have you heard forest bathing? That's a thing they do over in Japan and China. And they're saying that trees, and there's a couple tree books out there you can read. Trees give off eutosols and aerosols, and when you breathe them in, it kind of helps. And they talk about Native Americans, the Eskimos, and some of these places, that that's a cool thing. So trees, the first thing they do is provide oxygen. They make the neighborhood look friendlier. People drive slower. It cleans up the air. And so one of the things we're trying to do in Hamilton, there's been 30 years of no tree planting. Well, since 1791 until 17, 19, 2015, 225 years, there wasn't the tree guy. Well, now you have one. So my goal is to help get grants to try and reforest the city, plant the right tree in the right place. No big trees in the power line, no big trees. Another project we're doing, there's our three interns from Miami. We went out and did prairie restoration at the Riverside Natural Area out off a of river road behind the reclamation plant. We put in a couple hundred plants that were donated to us. And out there we've planted 200 swamp white oaks, 200 red buds. We planted, we got the first and only for a city. I got a $5,000 grant from the American Chestnut Foundation. So we have the only chestnut research plot. And my goal is, is that they'll produce seed in about five to seven years, and then we'll start planting chestnuts in our parks, of course, because we don't want a big pile of nuts falling on our cars in the streets, right? So I'm obviously considering that. But clean air, climate change, CO2, and here's the big thing. Trees can give you 30 to 40% on your air conditioning costs when they're shading and you plant them in the right place. You can go on the, uh, I believe it's the National Tree Benefit Calculator. It's by Casey Tree and Davy Tree. You can go in there and say, I live at 123 Main, I have a 20 inch hackberry and it's on the west exposure and it'll tell you what the benefits are or where, you can even go in there and move the tree around with the dot, it's really cool. And so that's things we're talking about when we're planting trees. There's our group, there we are out there, matter of fact, Louise Treeboard, hey, she's right there in the picture. And look at Judge Mosier, the fella right in the middle with the shovel. He is 90 years old and he was out digging us all. He was tearing it up. He walks 10 miles every morning. I can't believe it. He, he, he wears me out. He's always like, we got to go. He didn't know I had a backhoe out there with a drill on it. We had to dig the holes. But he, I go, Judge, if you want to dig holes, go over there. It was like a little kid. I just let him dig holes for a while. I didn't, it's, it's all good. He didn't know we weren't planting those trees. Now, don't tell the judge because I'll be in contempt. 
And there's us planting the swamp white oaks that we got out there. And actually, those trees were about two foot tall. And at the end of the summer, they grew three to four feet tall. So I had to put five foot tubes on them. The deer only got so far. I have 94 still standing. The deer got six. And so we're doing pretty well out there. And then we're going to relocate them. There's the swamp white oaks. So as far as tree planting, my goal is 300 trees a year. Uh, we purchase a couple hundred water bags. You see the green bags going out. People go, oh, the aliens have arrived. That we typically water from May 1st up till December 1st. And then we uh, have a couple interns that go out there and water and, of course, take care of the trees. And then what we're doing with all the new street trees at No Charge of Citizens is for the first two to three years to get them established, we're going to water them at no charge. And then we're also going to be pruning those trees every five years, again, at no charge. We're putting the right tree in the right place so when it grows up, we're not blocking signs. We're not having, you know, remember the square tree when the truck goes by or the plane or the snow plow. So we're doing all this good stuff. When you see tree planting program, we notify everybody. I'll be sending letters out soon. We're focusing on the east side of the city in the neighborhoods. When we did the survey, we were very devoid on this east side. So that's where we've been focusing all the efforts. And um, I apologize. I haven't learned all the 17 strong, but on this side of town specifically is where we're focusing. So you'll see those signs, says Hamilton Utilities, City of Hamilton Street Tree Planting. That number is me. Now I have to, I'm gonna have to put a piece of tape over that I'm getting a new number. So I fortunately made a thousand flags, so you'll see a little tape over it, but that's okay. Now that's my street tree planting for B Street. You know, it's getting hot. <laughs> and I thought that if I pull some palms from Florida, that maybe that would look good over on B Street between uh, B and D going up there. I thought that would be a good planning. All right, now restrictions. I'm not gonna read through all that. It's on your piece of paper, but I'm gonna give it to you as fast as I can like, a, like an auctioneer, right? So we need to be 15 feet away from a utility pole, 15 feet away from a fire hydrant, 15 feet away from your driveway, 10 feet away from underground utilities. So all the, that's up there. We, we won't plant a tree in anything smaller than four feet. So when I come to your house and you have a giant oak that's 100 foot tall and a two foot right away, it's gonna come out but not be replaced. Then uh, we also wanna really watch stormwater basins. We don't want anything within 10 feet because that causes Allen problems. So a lot of these things, and we're gonna put the right tree in the right place. So if you say, what kind of trees are we planting? I will give you our website and I have posters on there. And we're working on a real cool project called the Hamilton Story Map. It's a brand new thing, first one in the state of Ohio. I think we're winning a state award, it'll be real cool. Tree Board worked on it, interns, and we'll be coming out with that here in, in next month. And that'll really tell you the story. And then the follow up to that, we're gonna do the Hamilton Tree app where you can just click on it and say, I have a shady yard, wet, what kind of tree can I plant, large, medium, or small? So these are cool things that are coming out that'll help citizens. All right, let's keep going. Take a, take a look. There's that giant red oak, remember? We planted it in the two foot right away. It uprooted, fell on the house. It tore up the gas lines, the water lines. And that was a just, it, it even pulled up the blacktop. And then you can see the roots over there on the left picture. Now, I apologize for the picture, it's so small, but that sidewalk is actually jacked up eight inches. Now, the thing is, out there, those are two 150-year-old swamp white oaks and they're specimens. So what we're going to try and do is we have some new stuff called FlexiPave. It's this where we can pull up that and we can actually get it around the trees. And the FlexiPave is supposed to move with the tree and we can get it cement color. And we're going to basically save those two trees. And I'm working with the engineering, Alan and Pat and Joy, to, on certain trees where we're they're a specimen. Obviously, if it's a willow or a cottonwood, something that's not a good tree, something that falls apart, that's a storm damaged tree, obviously that'll go. But that's uh, something we're doing. Take a look at that. Now, look at that tree board. They're happy people. We're over at the Conservancy having a good time. We are a Tree City USA. And what is that? Well, we have a tree board. We do an Arbor Day program. We have a proclamation. We have an urban forestry management program. We have our priority removal program, Roost Dead and Declining Trees. We come through every five years, and of course our capital projects. And we do the underground landscape restoration, 300 trees a year. Take a look at that. Now, if there's an EAB, that's emerald ash borer in the tree, we've hired pointers to point them out. So if you see me going around with the dogs and they're pointing at the tree, we know that we can find them. If there are boar buzzards in your ash tree, that tells you that tree's a goner. So 
That is another detection. Now, I found a new disease, new pest in the city of Hamilton that is on ash trees. I got the call. They said, my tree's half dead, it's half alive. I can't figure it out. Would you come out? I came out and I looked at it and I went, yes. I called Ohio State University, Division of Forestry, and said, I know what it is, it's from Egypt. Do you concur? And they said, it is. So here's what it was for the lady. Felinus tachinus, cat scratch fever. Her cat was going out and clawing the backside of the tree and killing the water conducting cells. So there you go. That's pretty wild. And then I got the call from the mayor. You need to come to hole number eight. There's a hazard. What's the matter, mayor? You got to get out here now. Well, it was May. The snapping turtle came out of the pond at Potter's Golf Course, and he laid right there, and the mayor's ball was right by it. He goes, you got to handle it. So, of course, you know what I did? God bless Ohio State University, America's team of college football. I sent in the Michigan man to grab that turtle because I <laughs> was not going to grab that turtle, and that turtle had no part of us grabbing him. So, lastly... We do fun things with Arbor Day. You can see, now when you can get the principal to put Asian longhorn beetle antennas on in EAB glasses, you've accomplished it. And of course the mayor, we go out with the kids. We do Arbor Day program with all the Hamilton locals. This year we're gonna do St. Peter and the Chains. We do fun stuff because remember the kids are the future leaders. All the kids get a free tree, they get a bag of goodies, tells them all about trees and what we're doing. So that way down the road when they're the future council and mayor here in Hamilton, they'll go, hey, I remember the tree guy. All right, thank you very much. Can we give David a good hand? <laughs> so, hey, I want to thank you all for coming and attending tonight. Was there any questions for Dave? Dave? Oh, uh-oh. Boom. Okay. Now, if somebody privately cuts down a tree and there's a stump remaining, who do we call? I'm the guy. You can put in a 311 or call, call me and I'll come out and I'll deal with it. And just to give you a number, we have 925 stumps. So one of the things I'm working on with the city administration, city manager, mayor council is to actually get money and start addressing those. There are 925 in town and I know where they all are. Remember, we GPS them all. So I know them all by a number, number one through 15,000. So when I come to your house, oh, you're 13,350. Because that's how I know. But who pays for removing the stump? Though? Right now, it's the private citizen. That, I mean, the citizen they're responsible for stump removal, and I would send them a letter of citation. So. Okay, sure. Ross Avenue. Ross Avenue. Okay. Wait, I walk my dog four or five times a day. Sure. The ash trees that are dead. Right. Are huge. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen with all those before they they're falling down? Now. Right. So right now, what we're doing is I I just put in money a lot for a lot more. I'm, and I hope to find out in March or April to see how much they'll give me. And then I basically go to my list and it's kind of the, we did what we call a tree risk assessment qualification. It's called TRAC by Ohio ISA. It's International Society of Agriculture. That's where these trees are ranked. It's kind of like risk management, like an actuary. So basically we go out and try and get the next 150, not 200. So if someone calls me up and says there's a dead tree and it doesn't make my list, then of course I got to through the ordinance send a citation out. So that's a good question. Yes, sir, right here. Uh, this may seem like a complex question, but does does the homeowner have to get permission to trim or prune the tree or remove the tree? Or that's a great answer? question. Yeah, the, the question was, does a homeowner have to get a permit or permission from the city? And the answer is yes. Now the new rules are, you, I send you a permit, you have to follow the ANSI 300 proper pruner standing, so no more of this. No more top and internodal cutting and doing crazy stuff. So I would come out, look at the tree. The permit is free, it's no charge. And then we just ask that the company you use has a certified arborist on staff because we're trying to eliminate bad cuts on trees. Because when you do that internodal pollarding where they top them and they look like the devil, that just starts a slow death to that tree. Now, if someone prunes a tree and I don't know about it and you wanna call me, I have the power to go out and find them $1,500. That's if it's in the right-of-way. Correct, in the right-of-way, not their private yeah, yard. Right. So, for example, I get the trees touching the roof of a house, you know, the owner can trim the branches that are touching the roof without a permit. Well, you got to have a permit if the tree's in the public right-of-way between the curb and sidewalk. Uh, yeah. Don't I mean, touch that tree. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, private property, do what you want. Oh, yeah, but... Yeah. Sure, so whatever you, you want. want. Make it comply with the 14 feet. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need a permit. But yeah, and if it's back on your, I mean, if it's a city tree and it's reaching back toward your house, you still need the permit because it's a city tree. 
So we just don't want people stubbing trees off, if that makes sense. And if it's, if it's on the, the area between the sidewalk and the street, is that a city tree? Yeah, that's what it's defined as. Yeah. In the public right-of-way, when I talked the first slide, that's the public right-of-way in that zone between the curb and sidewalk. Or some of our streets just have grass, so it'd be from about the middle of the street. What's our width typically, 50, 60? 60, so you go from center street, 30 feet, so to the edge of the road is 15 feet, so typically about 15 feet in. But if you see where the utility pole is located or the utilities, that's typically where the right-of-way at in the front of your yard. So, so if there's a tree in that right-of-way between the sidewalk and the street and the branch is touching the roof of my house, I can have a tree without a permit? You need a permit for that. If, if the tree's in the public right-of-way, you need a permit, no matter what it's, where it's growing. Okay. okay. That's a good question. In the back? Yeah, if you have come and cut down a tree, ground the stump, but put the straw down, how do we know if you're going to plant another tree there or can we plant another tree? What we're doing is we're right now, I've got a couple interns and they're go out and we're assessing them all and then I'm going to get with engineering. I end up driving out with Alan, Pat, or Joy or one of the engineers and then we can verify all those rules I told you, restrictions. And then you'll get a letter from me saying you can or cannot plant a tree and here's the species and the types and all that good stuff. It'll be coming here soon. We're probably halfway through it because again, we took down 150 trees. So we're, we're probably about halfway through. So another 75 more to look at. That's a great question. Oh, all right. And uh, one of the slides you mentioned planting the improper tree in the public right way it becomes uh, too tall or it ends up uh, lifting up the sidewalk, but, right. but to, plant, to plant a tree in the right way, uh, uh, you know, the homeowner has to get a permit to plant any kind of tree. Right? That is correct. They have to get a permit from me. So sure. for any, for any and, and you just can't plant any tree. I would have to give you a list to pick from because, again, we're trying not to put an oak in a spot where it doesn't belong. Well, the good thing, the permit doesn't cost anything. Right? The permit is free. And I can come out and meet with you and talk to you, no problem. It's like Sam Walton. You just come on in. We're friendly here. Yes, sir. Don. Uh, Dave, have you guys thought about incorporating root barrier in your infrastructure on sidewalks to, to kind of preserve them if you're planting trees without, there's no lines overhead, you can get away with what's probably helpful to plant a larger tree that has a canopy, but to protect those sidewalks later on, is there, you guys ever thought about putting root, root barriers in? So what Don's asking the question is, there's material out there when you plant a tree that you can put along a sidewalk that basically tries to prevent the roots from going under and uplifting. And I've been to enough seminars and root barrier not, it's going to go. Okay, just the research. I, you know, I went to one last year. I, I flew out to Iowa State University as a keynote speaker. And in that talk, we had two researchers that basically said they used every root barrier there was. And it eventually got under and bucked it up. So I would say no in this city, we're probably not. But we are looking at doing some flexi pave as far as trying to save certain trees because there's some good specimens out there. I just hate to see them go. So that's a great question, Don, thanks. Anyone else? Outstanding, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to uh, thank, um, for again, for all of you who attended. This is one of the best attended uh, seminars we've had so far. Um, I'd like to thank Pat, um, I'm sorry, Alan Messer and Joy. I think Joy's gone now, and Rich Engel, who probably has left as well, and Mr. Beaneman. Uh, I mean, this guy is, uh, he brings nothing but entertainment throughout the day as well as in the evening. So, um, so again, my name is Jim Williams. I'm the Public Works Director. If you need or have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, these, um, uh, these presentations will, will be taped on TV Hamilton. They'll be available on YouTube probably within the coming month or so. Um, but thanks again for attending. Have a good night. <laughs>